If you are a fan of Unregistered, you should go to patreon.com slash unregistered and become a patron right now. When you do that, you'll have access to all the bonus episodes of Unregistered. You'll also have access to all the courses being taught at the new Unregistered Academy. We have many courses right now you can view by streaming, and we have many more scheduled as live webinars coming up throughout the summer. So again, go to patreon.com slash unregistered, and I'll see you soon. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Until recently, I, like many people, believed that the merger of technology with the human body would simply make life longer and better for all of us. But my guest this week has made me think again. This is my interview with Joe Allen. I am joined from Montana, a place I'd love to go someday, by Joe Allen, who I've been following for about a year now, I think. So, Joe, let me tell you, um, about 10 years ago, I'd say up to 10 years ago, I love technology. I had no reservations about it whatsoever. I was always defending the bros of Silicon Valley against my left wing friends. Usually left wingers were criticizing them then you know, for being capitalists, for being monopolists, for changing the world in what I thought were better ways. But a lot of people on the left in the Bay Area where I live didn't like them because they were rich. Nowadays, I am hearing much more criticism of the Silicon Valley bros and the tech elite, I suppose, from people on the right. And I think you're a man of the right, generally speaking. But I now am wondering if my embrace of technology and my optimism about it was misplaced because I've been hearing you talk for a year about how this thing called transhumanism is taking off, that it's this sort of subculture, or maybe even a cult among the tech elite, and that they have plans for me that I don't like the sound of. So let's do this. First of all, you know, the word transhumanism is going around, although I think very, very few people know what the hell that means at all, because it's a new new concept. And people like you, critics of it are, are also new on the scene. So why don't we just define this thing? And then let's get into the people who are part of this culture, and then dig down into the philosophy of it. So what the hell is transhumanism? And why should I care? Well, I, I think most basically, transhumanism is the quest to merge human biology with technology. And that human biology can be anything from one's uh, genetic code to one's neurological state. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think about transhumanism, they think about brain chips. And I, I think brain chips are a fantastic sort of symbol for everything transhumanism seeks to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk, of course, with his Neuralink is a, is a very popular example of this. Uh, the, the brain chip, uh, as it's imagined, uh, will be a way to enhance cognition. It will be a way to control computer systems and to commune with artificial intelligence. And it forms that link between the human mind or the human soul and the, the digital mind or the sort of digital soul of artificial intelligence. Now, uh, brain chips are probably a pretty good ways off. So I oftentimes point to uh, more kind of 
day-to-day uh, uh, -day mundane technologies as uh, the, the, the stepping stones to these sorts of extreme technologies. Musk has said much the same, and I think he's correct, that your smartphone is really uh, a, a cyborg device. It allows you to merge uh, in symbiotically with technologies mm. and technological systems that otherwise you would be completely disconnected from. So at its core, uh, transhumanism is the merging of human biology and human psychology with technology. Uh, it, you know, it, at the root of the word, it's been, uh, there's various takes on it, but, you know, it's a transitional humanity, this transition from uh, organic, the, 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 the traditional or evolved human being, the organic human being uh, towards a technologically enhanced or augmented human being. Uh, you could also think of it as transformational. Uh, so it's, you're transforming human beings into this. Uh, also, also uh, the term transcendent is used in that in that regard. So that you're talking about transcending human limitation, uh, all the limitations of our biology, including mortality, uh, but in particular the limitations to our cognition. I think uh, you know there is an obsession with intelligence among transhumanists, and uh, that's a really important point. Human beings are, are cognitively flawed. Uh, that has been pointed out by every major philo you know, philosophy or religious tradition in history. And, uh, you know, each one of these philosophies or religious traditions has its own sort of remedy for that limitation. Transhumanism puts forward technology as the remedy. Yeah, well, so wait a minute. I don't like a lot of human limitations. And why is it bad to use technology to transcend them? Haven't human beings been doing that since the dawn of time, since the dawn of human beings? We've used technology to transcend all sorts of limitations from, you know, building bridges over water to, you know, to now the artificial heart, which I guess, is that a bad thing? That's transhuman, isn't it? Uh, you could say so. I mean, I, I think to me, transhumanism is more about the orientation than the actual technologies themselves. Ah. So uh, in the case of an artificial heart or a cochlear implant or anything like that, or a bridge, you know, like a, a dental bridge, uh, I think to the extent that one sees that technology and, and sees that augmentation as the, the primary goal, right? Like th this is Th this is the, the center of focus so that uh, the, the artificial heart is seen in this case, right, just to take that example, is seen as just one stepping stone towards having, you know, a partially uh, artificial brain or, you know, an entirely mm -hmm. artificial brain or to upload one's consciousness into a computer. It's the orientation, really. I don't I don't really think that any technology in and of itself uh, m makes one a transhuman, right? Like the, the mm. people have asked me oftentimes, you know, does my, my hip, my, my artificial hip make me a cyborg or a transhuman? I mean, in a sense, mm. yes. But I think that um, insofar as, as we recognize that human limitations are pretty much a perennial uh, state, that we, we're not going to transcend this sort of physical limitation through technology in any real meaningful way in the sense that mm -hmm. I think digital immortality is a pipe dream. I think that more than likely um, artificial intelligence, no matter how advanced it becomes, will, will have this sort of inhuman and, and, and in essence anti-human nature to it that uh, to the extent that artificial intelligence is incorporated into a person's life or into the life of a society and is making critical decisions, uh, you've lost some element of humanity that is necessary to be human. And mm. so that, that orientation in which you're focusing always on this sort of technological being as the highest state or technology as the highest power, that to me is what makes transhumanism transhumanism. Uh, I, although I, I will say uh, that I don't think that any of these technologies from genetic engineering to neuro enhancement to robotics uh, to artificial intelligence, I don't think that any of them are exactly neutral mm. so that there are value systems or there are certain tendencies within those technologies that can't be escaped. But uh, to an extent, I think that uh, that, that sort of hard line, uh, that, that Luddite line, <clears throat> that mm -hmm. Uncle Ted line, I think that um, that in itself is also a, 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 a kind of a delusion because, as you say, technology is already interwoven into the fabric of, of human life. 
And all of us are dependent on it in one way or another. Even, even Ted uh, needed tools out there in his shed, uh, he, including uh, bomb making materials, apparently. But um, uh, so the, the idea that we can just simply discard technology and, and return to some sort of anarcho primitivist state. I, I'm, I'm dubious of that. I, I think that I'm glad that those people exist. I'm glad that they're constantly putting pressure on the system and, and really creating a sort of alternative framework. Uh, I, I'm very happy that the Derek Jensen's of the world exist. But um, at, at the same time, I think that it's just another extreme. For me, I just see I, we are definitely at a, a historical cusp where these technologies will be they're already being developed rapidly. Uh, so a lot of it's hype, a lot of it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that the kinds of transformations we're going to see in individual psychology and in society overall are going to be so sweeping and dramatic that uh, it, it really is why I became so obsessed with the transhumanist movement because it is a fantasy. It's just a fantasy world. It's a religious system. It's a mm. system of belief. And many of those beliefs have yet to come to fruition. But I also see a lot of these technologies rapidly catching up with that belief. So uh, for those of us who oppose by and large that orientation, we're going to have to make critical decisions as to where we stand and how we adopt or do not adopt these technologies. And you know, obviously for those who are more inclined towards transhumanism, the opportunities to see humanity ultimately transformed are opening up left and right. So yeah, this is a, this is a wild time that is. Yeah, so okay, so the problem with transhumanism. So transhumanism is not technology. It's not the use of technology to help us do things we can't do with our bodies. It's an ideology. It's an ism. And that's the problem, right? When you say orientation is the, is the problem, it's, is that, is that what you mean? It's a system of thought, a system of ideas. Absolutely. Okay. And, and a system of values. Right. And it's just, okay, now the thing you just said though, that really struck me, and I'm not sure I've heard you say it just like that. Things will be lost when we, transcend the human we will be lost what will, what will be lost well it depends on which technologies we're talking about but already yeah. you see uh for instance with the smartphone um there is uh you know when, when people adopt that technology to its extremes you see all these uh, uh human abilities these normal organic human abilities begin to atrophy everyone knows people mm. like this uh mm. probably many of your listeners right now will see it in, in themselves and to the extent that I've tried to avoid it, I guess I've been able to avoid it. But really, I, you know, that especially in the last year and a half, that tech dependency has become more and more obvious in my own life. So that um, the ability to find one's direction, uh, the ability to make uh, just basic decisions as to what one's going to do with one's day or what one's going to do with one's life, to the extent that that dependency is centered and focused on that device, you've now lost all of these previously valuable systems, right? Like just human to human connection, mm -hmm. simply asking people for directions or it, it, again, in the, like the, the more um, dramatic sorts of changes that you see in people, uh, the ability to gather information so that, you know, I think libraries represent a sort of peak technology, right? Like the, the organization of libraries and, and the way in which it allows people to browse information and then dig deep as they choose. And it provides a sort of quiet space space to do so. I think that's a peak technology that is being swept away by the internet and by digital based research methods. There are advantages to that dig to digitally based research methods. I'm, no mm -hmm. one would deny that it's very easy to mm -hmm. search specific things. It's very easy to keep track of where you've been. But um, I, I think to the extent it's supplemental, it's helpful to the extent that these technologies sweep those sorts of older organic or at least more visceral and physical ways of life away, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. they are doing rapidly. You look at the mm -hmm. educational system and you see the way in which e-learning has become really the, the, the go to, especially post pandemic for the, the means of pedagogy. I, I think that uh, we're losing something very, very valuable to the extent that we allow the, the, the enthusiasm for t new technologies to simply sweep away the old. And uh, here's another example. Um, hmm. Look at um, uh, vaccination, right? The, the, the mass vaccination uh, 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 
quest that uh, the, our medical establishment has undertaken. And uh, I, I think that for some people, especially older people, people who are uh, uh, really, really vulnerable to the coronavirus, uh, I, I think it may be helpful for them. But I think that younger people, by and large, do much better. Studies have certainly borne this out. If they simply get the virus, get over it, and go forward with natural immunity. Uh, the, the entire concept behind the Great Barrington Declaration, in which they encouraged mm -hmm. targeted protection of those who are vulnerable, and, and for everyone else who's young and has the immune system to handle it, to get the virus so that you can create a sort of herd immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there may be some, some flaws with it, but it's certainly no more flawed than the idea of mass vaccination, especially given that the vaccines seem to compromise immunity to some extent. So I think that that's another example of an artificial method, a technological method that is seen as being superior to what nature has endowed us with, however flawed it may be. Mm -hmm. And I think that to the extent that we adopt all of these different technologies, one by one by one by one, until we become, in essence, a sort of proto-cyborg, uh, we're losing everything that, that whether you see it as nature having you know, evolved over the course of hundreds of thousands or millions of years, uh, nature giving us these, these bodies, uh, these sorts of social structures, or if you see it as divine, if you see it as God having, uh, you know, reached down and, and created humanity as we were, uh, and, and technology sweeping away this God-given plan, however you, you look at it, this new technological sort of system, this new hyper uh, technological system uh, threatens, I think, many of the older, more ancient ways. And I think that they're, they're worth preserving. Hmm. I'm not convinced. <laughs> so if you, if you were to drop me onto a farm, right, I would starve to death because I wouldn't know how to operate any of the machinery. I wouldn't know how to grow food. I don't know how to grow food. Most people are like that these days, right? hundred years ago, most people did grow food. Um, and they were able to, but that's a good thing. I mean, I can now just go to the store and get food from anywhere in the world at any time. Isn't that better than having to grow the tomatoes in the ground myself? Well, so I, you know, there's two different answers to that. One, yeah, it's better so long as that complex that complex system sustains itself. Um, you know, uh, the, the more complex a system gets, the more fragile it becomes. And especially as we come to these crisis moments, there, you know, you see it in small crises, right? Like, so, uh, you know, when a, a natural disaster hits and suddenly everyone's scrambling for, for food or shelter or water, uh, those who prepped, you know, and those who are, you know, somewhat mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, uh, self-sustaining yeah. tend to do very, very, very well in those situations. And th those are just very small little microcosms right. of what would happen if a much larger collapse were to occur. Sure. Now, you know, I grew up in the South uh, with this sort of apocalyptic uh, uh, framework. It, it hasn't really borne out yet. And I think that people who spend a lot of time or all of their time preparing for the end of the world uh, tend to waste a lot of time that could have otherwise been spent uh, taking advantage of the society that we have and may have, you know, going forward. That being said, um, let's just imagine that this system does keep going forward with only just a few hiccups here and there. I, I think that that connection to the earth, which people, the reason you have all these kind of hipster boutique farms cropping up everywhere, yeah. and the reason there is this passion for the sort of farmer's right. market culture right. is because people recognize that that connection, that psychological and spiritual connection to the earth and to the natural processes is something valuable, yep. something worth maintaining. Now, can that be maintained side by side with a sort of hyper-technological civilization? Possibly. Uh, but I think that, again, it's that, that impulse to sweep away all that is old and replace it with that which, was, which is new. That is really the, the, the major threat that you get from the transhumanist ideology. Yeah. And, and uh, everything from education to uh, social interaction to romance uh, to one's economic life. And then even going forward into the end of life, Technology has come to mediate all of these these really very important spheres of human experience. And to me, it, it, it impoverishes those experiences by and large. Okay. And it, it's that that's a purely aesthetic position. Now, mm. somebody could say, I don't really like those old ways. I don't give a shit nice. about farms. I don't give a shit nice. about sunsets. You know, I like the virtual world better. Uh, there's really no answer to that. That's just simply an aesthetic orientation. That's what I like, right? So um, for me, I, I think that, and it's 
maybe because of my upbringing. Maybe it's because of, you know, certain literature or experiences I've had throughout my life. Uh, I, I tend to, to, to find much more valuable, uh, much more value in those ancient systems, in, in, in the older systems. Uh, it, it may seem arbitrary and maybe it is to me. I really don't give a shit. I don't right. think that there's anything, any justification one needs more than one's aesthetic, the deepest aesthetic sense. And so in, in that regard, um, yeah, I mean, you know, th those who don't want to farm, well, uh, you know, there's always Kroger. God, I love what you just now. said. I love what you just said. And by the way, to me, that's, I've seen this kind of thinking among people on the right lately, which I would call it, there's a merger, and you're not going to like this, a merger of conservative thinking with postmodernism. Because what you're doing is you're not making, you're, you're saying I'm not making an absolute universal claim about the morality of this thing or the absolute goodness or badness of this thing. You're just saying, I just don't like it aesthetically. It's just my subjective choice. And if other people agree with me on their, on the values, they're going to, they're going to join me in the fight against transhumanism. I think that's wonderful. And I love that kind of politics. But you're, you know, you're not making an absolute universal moral claim about it, right? You're saying it might be transhumanism might be good for some people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are rationalizations, <clears throat> and I've certainly made them myself, to say that these technologies are very dangerous, and that uh, you know they they very some some of them very well could, uh, if not wipe out humanity, certainly diminish the quality of life on Earth. So I mm. think that there are rational reasons. Uh, to reject at least extreme uh, the, the adoption of extreme technological lifestyles. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think that at, at base, most people run on the basis of rationalization. And in fact, I think mm. even the most rational mm. people exhibit certain preferences uh, that really put the lie to the notion that I have reasoned this out and therefore my worldview or my philosophy is the result of, of, of rational calculation beginning from first principles and moving on to whatever sort of social program or personal philosophy I'm going to live out. So uh, yes, I, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily see it as I understand what the, the, that resonance you're talking about between postmodernism and the sort of, uh, you know, the, the preference for traditionalism. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's one key difference, and that's that postmodernism is uh, always deconstructing. It's, it's, it's this pattern. It's a pattern of uh, right. uh, really just destruction, constant destruction. There's never a base to stand on. There's never a foundation, mm -hmm. at least if you're a true postmodernist. Mm -hmm. Whereas traditionalism is, I mean, that is the ultimate foundation. Mm -hmm. Now, you, it has to be admitted, though, that, uh, you know, you look at, unless you just simply say my tradition, you know, let's, I, I, I'm a, a, a radical conservative Catholic who believes only in the Tridentine masks, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you, unless you say that is literally the only way, or the, the highest form of life on the planet, and all other forms should be subjugated to it or replaced by it, then you have to admit to the diversity of tradition. Uh, and, and in that regard, it, it's, it's also, in some sense, there's a vacuum beneath your feet. Once you come to the realization or the admission that, uh, you know, human life has produced all sorts of traditional orientations, and those traditional orientations are in constant transformation themselves, uh, then, then you have to realize that there's not necessarily any one absolute anchor outside of the one that you have uh, basically just set your mind to somewhat arbitrarily. But I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, that's the situation that we're in now. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as opposed to what? As opposed to the, the, the constant chaos and, and ferment of the, the sort of postmodernist mindset. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that any kind of real life can be had out of that other mm -hmm. than it, it, it always, the, peop the postmodernists whom I've known always tend towards hedonism because hedonism is the sort of immediate anchor for consciousness. Mm. I think that um, traditionalism as a whole offers a, a, a rich variety of ways of, of, of drawing in the universe and in orienting yourself to the universe. And however arbitrary it may be to choose one tradition and follow that path, or even maybe, you know, what Houston Smith would have called the uh, sort of salad bar effect where you're just picking and choosing from different traditions. It's still better, I think, than uh, that emptiness that sits at the, the bottom of postmodernism and ultimately that emptiness that sits at the bottom of the, the, the sort of hedonic culture that we see around us now. God, that was brilliant. That was maybe the best uh, 
argument for traditionalism I've ever heard what you just said. I, I fully endorse that. And, you know, I don't know, you must be, a, you must know about Alexander Dugan. He was on my show, but you're sounding quite a bit like him, but I think you, you articulate this traditionalism better than he does. Even it's this idea. It's, it's non-imperialist. It's right. It's, it, it's base. It's non-imperialist, anti-imperialist, you know, recognizing a multitude of traditions and not making a claim of one being superior to the others. Uh, Wow. I mean, that's every liberal in the country and the world should embrace that. Well, you know, there's there's one issue that I think that always comes up and uh, it's it's a real problem. Right. So to the extent that uh, relativism has allowed certain traditions, let's just look at the Catholic tradition, for instance. Mm, yeah, right. uh, that's what, I, what I'm probably the most uh, immersed in. Uh, it, 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 you look at the Catholic tradition. And you see all the ways in which modernity has challenged it, uh, the ways in which uh, Catholicism has uh, in many ways given up uh, its, its claim to moral certitude because of, of the challenge of modernity and post-modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing now with the sort of resurgence of traditionalism, or in the Orthodox Church in, in, in the East, with Russia, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what we're seeing now is this attempt to reclaim territory on behalf of tradition. And, and so I think that there has to be a realization that uh, one can't just simply say, uh, you know, I am Eastern Orthodox, I'm Russian Orthodox, uh, but I'm going to live side by side with this new, you know, postmodern framework or these sort of Western liberal values. Um, right now, all over the world, uh, Hindutva in, in, in India, um, the, you know, e even you could say Tibetan Buddhists are, are trying to reclaim territory because within a traditional system, within a traditional society, there has to be a high degree of intolerance. You can't allow for many of the, the things that Western liberal culture uh, pushes on us. You can't allow right. for them uh, to live side by side in your cultural centers. Right. And so liberals, I think, are, are, are rightfully uh, nervous about the rise of traditional systems because there's, you know, in Christianity, historically, there's never been a sense of a limit as to how far that territory can be expanded. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, you know, in, in, in the past three, four centuries, Christianity has been chastened and in some sense humbled uh, insofar as Christianity as a power structure is concerned. Uh, but it, I think that there is a, a real anxiety on the part of liberals, people who want to see a sort of you know pluralistic society, uh, when they see something like Russia, they see the, the Russian military fusing with the Eastern Orthodox Church, they see Putin um, uh, expanding Russian territory, or you could say reclaiming territory on the basis of uh, reestablishing a traditional system. The reason there's that anxiety is because it, it requires a, a, a degree of a, the exertion of power in order to maintain a traditional society. It requires a degree of intolerance. And to the extent that intolerance and to the extent that territorialism is maintained, liberal ideals cannot thrive. Yep. So I don't have any sort of like, a, you know, Dugan, I think, uh, really does express uh, from a Russian perspective uh, a sort of pluralism that still allows for territorial integrity. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of America, I, 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 uh, people are working this out. I think it's a very, very difficult proposition uh, because America is so pluralistic. It's so diverse and is becoming you know, rapidly diversified in many ways that uh, we were never diverse before. And how you're able to maintain certain structures within certain cultural centers without, you know, running afoul of the law or yeah, uh, right. at the very least undermining the, the, the basic freedoms and pluralism at the, at the core of the American project, I don't know. But what I do know is that we've hit an extreme now where you've got little tranny babies, five-year-olds doing dances <laughs> for adults, and, and, they, and they are so unashamed of it that they're, they're putting it on the internet right like they, they're literally filming it and putting it on the internet so once you see those sorts of high watermarks of, of liberalism and, and tolerance uh, expressing themselves uh, you have to brace for that traditionalist backlash and and i think that ultimately that's a healthy thing wow so liberals should embrace your anti-imperialist philosophy but they don't because liberalism certainly in this country and i would say in the west generally for at least 100 years has been imperialistic 
as you're saying. I mean, Dugan, this is Dugan's mm-hmm. argument. It's been my argument since before I heard about Alexander Dugan. Just look at the history of it. Now, the philosophy of modern liberalism might be one thing, but the way it's been practiced and enacted has been global imperialism. There's no question about it. I mean, the wars that we all know about, one, two, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, all of them have been in the name of advancing liberal values across the globe, forcing liberal values onto societies. Now, all of a sudden, Iraq is voting and has you know gay rights in it. Well, what about the people there? What about the tradition? Is that part of Iraq's history? Is it an organic part of that society? No and no and no, but we're going to do it anyway with the 82nd Airborne helping us. I, I, I just love what you're saying here. Let's get into transhumanism, though. What is the origin of this thing? I mean, of course, you know, when they first built thousands of years ago, when they first made something to help us act in the world, you know, that transcends our limitations. That, that was the first thing, a bow and arrow or whatever. But as an idea, as an ideology, right? Because that's what it is. Transhumanism, we've established this, is an ideology. Where do you see the origin of it? When did this start? Uh, you know, that's a very good question. Uh, I think probably in many ways with um, uh, Augusta Comte, the, the mm-hmm. father of sociology, um, uh, you know, he, he had proposed a, a sort of religion based on science that, uh, you know, and he saw this sort of universal church coming out of oh. France uh, that was ran kind of side, wow. side by side with the French Revolution. This, these, wow. He wasn't the only one to articulate this idea, but he's the one that I've spent the most time uh, reading. And, and I, I think that that idea that science, like the, the openly articulated idea that science uh, would replace religion and, and you know, later on technology would become the ultimate expression of that science, uh, I, I think that's really at the, the core of what transhumanism has become. Uh, even before uh, uh, Compton, though, you had uh, you know, Francis Bacon with The New Atlantis, the unfinished novel mm-hmm. that he did. And I mean, he's talking about these machines that, you know, he saw them as like uh, the series of mirrors that would allow one to, you know, see across the, the, the planet. It, it really has this, this sort of internet feel to it when you read uh, the, the, passage, the, the, the relevant passages. So this idea goes back a long way, but it was first, you know, the, the term transhumanism was coined by Julian Huxley in 1957. Mm. Oh um, it, there, was, there was an <laughs> essay collection, uh, New Bottles, or I'm sorry, uh, New Bottles for New Wine. And the very first essay in that collection is uh, transhumanism. He didn't really discuss technology. And as it's been pointed out by guys like uh, Kevin Kelly, you know, you don't have the word technology really didn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, usage until you know, the 50s and 60s. Uh, the idea of like distinguishing certain arts or certain techniques or certain machinery from the, the sort of surrounding human culture uh, really didn't take off until after uh, the, the Second World War, at least not in a, mm-hmm. a, in a, in a, in a philosophical sense. Mm-hmm. Obviously, as people developed planes and things like that, they knew that something dramatic was happening. But um, so transhumanism uh, as a term goes back to, to Julian Huxley. And I think it's really interesting. You know, his brother, Aldous Huxley, the author of A Brave New mm-hmm. World, uh, describes already then in the 30s, b- before uh, uh, you know, Huxley had come to articulate this, before Julian had come to articulate this, he, he, uh, Aldous had foreseen a society in which, uh, you know, technology is used to dull human instinct, to dull the, the natural human state. And that the, to me, the character, that, that primitive uh, character, I, I what did they call him? Um, I don't even think he had a name, but you know, you know, the, the, uh, the tribesman who finds himself, you know, uh, lost in this, this bizarre new world of orgy porgy and Soma. Um, I think he's probably the most sympathetic character because what, what Aldous Huxley foresaw was a total rearrangement of the human being and 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 he saw in this primitive character something that was worth preserving i think Um, his brother julian was far more uh, optimistic about technology and where it would go and so you also had uh you know in the in the 40s and 50s um uh theorists like norbert wiener 
um, who you know really is the, the the father of cybernetics and the idea behind cybernetics is that it allows the animal control over nature through the machine but it also allows the machine a certain degree of control over the animal and he foresaw mm -hmm. this fusion of uh, the human being with machines and, and in his book uh, god and Gollum inc he describes the ways in which technology has come to replace religion and uh, you know really picking up on those older themes so intellectually transhumanism and, and even guys like uh, i.j good who was a, a computer scientist who who uh, had coined the term uh, our last invention uh, or our final in invention the idea it, it, he had art articulated in the 60s that once artificial intelligence and robotics had reached a certain point and began self-improving then human beings would no longer have to invent anything and that technology would just take off on its own sort of course and human beings would be in many senses uh, 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 subject to it, uh, you know, we, I oftentimes think of it as like uh, we would be like lamprey eels on the belly of a shark, that we would mm -hmm. be nothing but parasites at best. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, these ideas are, are very, very old, but uh, the movement, transhumanism as a movement, really, you know, came to the forefront in the 80s and 90s with extropy. Uh, this is Max mm -hmm. Moore, the philosopher right. Max Moore and the extropian movement, the idea of extropy being the opposite of entropy. The universe is constantly winding down. Uh, the order and the structures in the universe are constantly subject to degradation just due to the laws of physics. But he believed that extropy could be achieved through the proper channeling of technological uh, forces that one could not only uh, you know, move past just the tendency of, of social structures to break down or machines to break down, but ultimately, you know, stop the human personality from breaking down and achieve some degree of immortality. And it, from, from really from that point forward, transhumanism became an established movement first on the sort of hippie fringes. And it was actually really uh, much more appealing at that point, I think, yeah, uh, you right. know, before uh, Silicon Valley gave it uh, the sort of corporate flavor that it has now. But you could already see what I consider to be um, extremely arrogant and, and I, I think probably delusional dreams of using technology to overcome every human limitation and to create gods of ourselves on Earth and in the case of artificial intelligence, to create an actual digital god on Earth that could rule human society better than any human being could. Julian Huxley coined the term transhumanism. So I know a few things about Julian Huxley. So he was a progressive, huge champion of the New Deal, loved Franklin Roosevelt's government. He wanted to extend the New Deal across the planet. He wanted every country in the world to have the government that we had in the United States under Franklin Roosevelt. So he became a member, a staffer for the United Nations. I forget his title, but he was an official, an officer of the United Nations. And the other thing about uh, Julian Huxley was he, that he was, and I know you know this, an arch eugenicist. Yes. So progressivism, eugenicism, and transhumanism, might those things be connected? Yes, uh, inextricably linked. Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, you know, you look at the, uh, the 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 quest to use CRISPR, or, or you know, the, the dream far precede, long precedes CRISPR. But this this idea that human beings can take hold of their own evolution and direct the genetic course mm -hmm. of the race, uh, you know, that is at its core eugenic, right? Like you 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 have this idea yeah. that human beings are genetically flawed and that technology can be used to bring us to a higher and higher state of intelligence and beauty endurance all of this uh, but I, I you know i would also say that uh, the the transhumanist argument that uh, all of this is on a spectrum is also by and large correct that uh, the, you know in choosing a beautiful or an intelligent partner uh, to marry and, and and have children with you are in some sense practicing soft eugenics right and uh, to say that you know in more intelligent people should you know have more children than less intelligent people which mm -hmm. is just another click further 
other. Um, that is, in essence, eugenics. And then it goes yep. on and on until you get to the point where you are actively eliminating any <laughs> perceived flawed creature and using CRISPR or whatever sort of technological method uh, to uh, you know, actually introduce new and, and, and superior genes into the race. Right. So, uh, you know, eugenics is, is one of the many sort of mad quests at the core of transhumanism that, you know, ultimately is just progressivism writ large with a lot of really interesting toys added on to it. So, yeah, I, I would say that, that that connection you're drawing there, 100%. Yeah, a little scary. Globalist eugenics. My goodness. I mean, and they're, they're, they're globalists, of course. The transhumanists now, as they always have been, want to help everyone transcend the limitations of their bodies in the world right they want to they want to export this stuff as fast as they can don't they you know it depends there is it's a very diverse movement uh okay. it's, I, I oftentimes find myself uh defending or uh uh it, it, uh, it sounds oftentimes like i'm uh defending transhumanism or transhumanists and i guess to some extent i am uh, you know once you've immersed yourself into any sort of uh ideological framework and people from the outside come and you know they say things like, "Well, all transhumanists want to do is turn human beings into robots." Da 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 da. Like some for sure, uh, but it, it is a, a really broad movement. So you know you've got a, a heavy libertarian strain. I think libertarian strain really, by and large, couldn't give a shit what the meat people do. Uh, you know they they don't mm. necessarily talk about eradicating them. They just talk about out competing. And they believe that, uh, you know, in the end, over the course of a couple of few centuries, uh, the meat people will just be this sort of irrelevant. They'll be like monkeys, you know, um, they're useless, no different. You, useless, according to Yuval Harari, right? They're useless. Uh, well, and then there's a, there's another position, right? Like uh, the, this idea. Well, he's actually saying we have to do something with these people, right? Okay. That's, that's his, you know, Harari, you know, uh, people hit me all the time on this, but I, I think Harari is probably the best pop writer who has addressed transhumanism as a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, because he's so like snakish and devious and because of his, uh, you know, obvious malice towards uh, traditional religion, uh, it makes him very easy to hate. Uh, and he's also really good at putting together sinister sound or at, at, at putting out uh, sinister sound bites. But like, if you watch any one of those sound bites, except for one, there's one in which he's, it's a very early video in which he's talking with uh, Klaus Schwab personally. And uh, that one's, a, that's a pretty grim video from beginning to end. Uh, but once he actually burst onto the scene at the World Economic Forum and, you know, various other sort of intellectual hubs, uh, his argument always was that these technologies uh, pose a tremendous threat to human freedom and a tremendous threat to human dignity. Mm. And we have to do something to uh, mitigate these these dangers. If you just take a tiny little snippet of Yuval Noah Harari, you know, where he's like, uh, because of the pandemic, uh, the surveillance will soon go under our skin and then that's it. Well, then it sounds like he's saying we need to start injecting people with nanobots and monitoring mm. everything in their, their brains and their bodies. It's not at all what he was saying. What he's saying is that this is right now the pandemic has offered an enormous opportunity for the power structures that most endanger human freedom and dignity to impose their sort of technological vision onto the rest of humanity. He's mm. position. He's framing it as a problem. Uh, that being said, he's a, mm. he's he's kind of a, a snakish character, so he really asks for the demonization that he gets. Um, so when he's talking about the useless class, right, he's pretty sneering. He probably doesn't care that much about the useless class, uh, mm -hmm. but he's not saying we have this useless class. We should, you know, mulch them up and turn them into dog food. Um, he's saying that you know, because all of these jobs are going to be displaced by technology and automation, which is happening, uh, the powers that be, who he was addressing, the World Economic Forum and all the people that gather in that hub, uh, need to do something to find some, you know, some way to allow all these people who will not have jobs to find fulfillment. Now he's a cynical fuck, so you know he says, "Give them drugs and 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 virtual reality, maybe that'll do it." Uh, so you know, in that regard, yeah, fuck him. But I, 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 I'm also quite 
uh, defensive, I guess, of his work, because I do think that Homo Deus, at least at the time of its publication, 2016, really did represent the first major public kind of pop critique of transhumanism. Uh, so going back to that variety, right, that variety of ideas, uh, you have people like Ray Kurzweil, who you know foresees the singularity in which uh, self-improving technology will just see this exponential increase. And in, in basically, historically speaking, the blink of an eye, you will see technologies that completely alter the human genome, that completely alter the human psyche, uh, that completely alter the physical reality around us. And then moving out of these sort of uh, you know, these, these centers of innovation, you will have the singularity in which humanity is completely transformed, basically in the blink of an eye as it spreads across the planet. And then in his vision, all these guys are very sci-fi in their, in their thinking, in his vision out across the galaxy and out into the into the rest of the universe. Um, you know, this is sort of uh, this, this machine human hybrid uh, will will conquer the world. And, and, and so and, and that, that's another sort of strain of thought in the transhumanist movement. Others uh, like Nell Watson, who is a chair at uh, IEEE. Um, Nell Watson uh, is, I think, very sensitive to all the human beings who want nothing to do with this. And has a, she's constantly cautioning against this this sort of uh, imperialist idea that the, the, the technologically advanced human will should and will dominate all other non enhanced uh, non augmented humans, and uh, she's always warning against the the sort of uh, hubris that transhumanists tend to exhibit. So I, I, hopefully that wasn't too long winded, but I guess it, 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 the center of what I'm saying, you had originally asked, don't these people want to push this out onto the rest of humanity? Yeah. Some in the case of uh, Ray Kurzweil. Yes, I would say definitely. Uh, in the case of, say, Ben Gertzel, uh, I think that he just sees it as being the power of these technologies okay. being so great that human beings will just inherently have to submit. Um, others like Max Moore, uh, you know, he has a much more kind of libertarian uh, slant on this. And, mm -hmm. and yes, I, I think he ultimately sees transhumanists as ruling over the planet. Uh, <laughs> but I, for the most part, he doesn't really give a shit about the people who want to be left behind. Right. Like he just mm -hmm. sees it as, you know, fuck, let, let them let them eat cake or, you know, or roots and berries or whatever it is that we end up eating. So um, it, it, there's a really broad spectrum of ideas in, in, in this movement, and all of them, to me, uh, represent this sort of, uh, this, this desire for self-deification, or at least the deification of machines in order to replace what traditional religion in their minds has failed to provide. But uh, even that, there are Christian transhumanists, uh, Mormon transhumanists, uh, certainly Buddhist transhumanists, a plenty. So um, you know, there's there's such a wide range of views. There's there's no one monolithic block. Okay. The singularity. This word keeps cropping up, and it's Ray Kurzweil's concept, and you sort of described it here. But I want to get a definition here. The singularity is it not like a prediction of his that at a certain moment that all this stuff will come together? Y yes, that, absolutely. Okay. Uh, it, it, it shifted, you know, forward and backwards, but 2045 is pretty <laughs> much the date he nails it to. Uh, he's not saying that in two, uh, at 2045, yeah. it will be, it will really be a, like a literal blink of the eye. But what he is saying, you know, his, his predictions are looking at exponential growth. And so he points to all these different technologies, like the, the whole range of human technologies and the, the uh, increased complexity of human technologies or human society, whatnot shows an exponential curve and he believes that the the current digital technologies or he, he really nails it down to uh, uh, genomics uh, nanotechnology and robotics with ai falling under the the category of robotics that these will feed off of each other and create a a, a situation in which either in in certain hubs of innovation or in multiple hubs of innovation uh, the technology will take off and human beings, and, and, and most importantly, with artificial intelligence, will begin to self-improve. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that convergence of all these technologies with the introduction of self-improvement by way of artificial intelligence will create a technological, we will hit a technological singularity, <clears throat> basically a metaphor taken from mathematics 
where you, you have humanity reaching a point at which there is no return, right? Mm. There, there's no going back from that. Human beings have altered themselves so inextricably that, or, 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 sorry, oh. uh, 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 so um, irreversibly right. uh, that uh, th th there's really no way that you can say that human beings are even human anymore in the, in the, the traditional sense. We will now be a humanity 2.0. So uh, the singularity is, again, in his vision of, of, of technological progression, he, he's pegged it at 2045. Other singularitarians say, oh, well, that's too aggressive. It'll be more like, you know, 2100, you know, 2200. Mm -hmm. uh, some say, no, it, we're, we're already basically there. And so it's, huh. it, so, again, you run into, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I'm, yeah, so the, the advent of homo deus right is what we're talking about that's the singular right where man becomes yes. a god man is no longer a man human beings are no longer human beings you are you are i've heard you say this is delusional and it will never happen is, is that what you still you still stand by that I, I don't think that it's safe to say that anything will never happen sure. um i i do look at a lot of the predictions that kurzweil made you know 2006 he saw he foresaw by now we would have widespread virtual and augmented reality that the metaverse would be commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, he also predicted uh, that by 2030, you would have whole brain emulation in silico, right? That you would have a, a, a computer that had replicated in silico the human brain, which would be a, a major step towards the singularity, because right. then it could begin self-improving. Um, <laughs> unless it is existent in some sort of you know highly secretive laboratory somewhere, nothing even close to that has been created. So okay. I think that he is uh, overly aggressive. Uh, I, 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 you know, sorry Ray, but I don't think he'll live to see 2045 when his his um, uh, predictions fail. At the same time, uh, I, I think that it's really important to look at the whole picture of what he's talking about, because even if you just shift the dates forward or backwards, you know, by decades or centuries, you're still talking about the same overall progression of humanity towards a total fusion, a total symbiosis with machines. And I think that um, if you get past the specifics, um the the broader vision of what he's talking about uh that is taking place so uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to be a committed singularitarian to at least take very seriously uh the 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 overall sort of vision of what he wants to see happen now am i right that religious critics of transhumanism find that aspect of it to be the most troubling that the making of man into god is what they find to be offensive in a sense. Am I right? Uh, absolutely. I okay. mean, I, I think, you know, but, the, but, but, the idea not, of, but it's not, but it's not going to happen, right? You're, you're saying it's most likely not going to happen. Man will never be God. I think that it's very unlikely that human beings will create uh, an artificial intelligence system that surpasses human capacity. Right. Uh, that's not to say that it can't happen or won't happen. I, I think that it's very unlikely to happen in our lifetimes. What I think is very, very likely to happen, which is happening right now, mm. is that human beings will create artificial intelligence systems that are sufficiently powerful, sufficiently mm. predictive, uh, sufficiently articulate, that, they, that you will have a whole sects of humans, you know, still human beings who come to kind of worship these technological creations in the same way that, you know, a, 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 a fetish cult would, would, you know, worship a, a, a massive penis in the middle of a, mm. a you know, a fire circle or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we already see that happening. Mm -hmm. So, and, and these are not just marginal people. Transhumanists are oftentimes characterized as nerds in their basements uh, who are just simply dreaming these things up the, mm -hmm. the ideas behind transhumanism have suffused silicon valley and in many ways suffused <laughs> chinese tech culture and indian uh -oh. tech culture and israeli tech culture um yeah. it's it's not there are plenty of people who do not adopt those viewpoints but there are plenty who do and so i think to the extent that powerful people believe that this religious system this religious system is valid mm -hmm. and that in fact the creation of an artificial intelligence system that is superior to human beings should be implemented you, know, you 
should do it, and then having created it, that its decision-making powers should be deferred to over and above human beings, that is already happening. Love that, it. to me, is the threat. Yep. Nice. Now, if they create God, you know, in silico, well, then we're fucked. So, <laughs> but... Or, or either we're fucked or we're saved. It depends on how you look at but, it. But, but, Joe, um, he, but Joe, he's going to be a much more efficient God. Yeah, that's for sure. Funny. <laughs> the efficiency mean, would be miraculous. Yeah, I mean, the thing all boils down to efficiency, right? The value, valuation of efficiency, the valorization of efficiency. Isn't that the sort of chief value here? You know, I, I guess it is uh, in many ways. Yeah, you, you yeah. get rid of all the sort of fluff of, of, of human indecisiveness and human yeah. weakness, and you just go straight to the, 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 the power trip. You know, when I think this started, I think it started with the in invention of factories in the 19th century, because I've called that the machinification of the human body. And I never connected it to transhumanism. But, you know, that's when they took people off of farms, off of, you know, in agrarian settings and they put them in these giant factories which are boxes with machines in them and then they had to adapt their bodies to the machines and essentially make the body into a machine where you do the same you perform the same function over and over again for six eight ten or twelve hours a day and that is your whole consciousness it's supposed to be your whole consciousness while you're on the job it's right. an utterly artificial setting it's the making of a person again to emulate a machine i would say um and i think that kind of thinking it's very similar to the kind of thinking now, like Fordism, right? Henry Ford in the assembly right. line, getting people to get comfortable with and, and love being so efficient on the assembly line. And again, doing the same function over and over again. It's being a functionary. It's the utility of things that matters to them, right? And Henry Ford was not a progressive, interestingly, but he certainly, he, he was sort of a progressive in this way in terms of technology and its relationship to human beings and the body, right? I, I mean, I think that early industrial capitalism might be the origin of it maybe i don't know i certainly going neck and neck it's very difficult yeah. you know there's so yeah. many different threads coming together i think you're, you're just pulling out uh you know different but very very valid movements that yeah. happened during during and after the industrial <laughs> revolution that that came to be mm -hmm. seen then as transhumanism but um so yeah I, there's there's no there's certainly no one strain Right. At least so far as I can tell, there's no like one singular origin. And so I think this idea of uh, the factory and the the kind of um, I think you just said the machinification of, yeah. of human existence. I think that that's a, a really, really important step. Uh, you know, of course, transhumanists see this this future of radical abundance in which no human being has to perform work of any sort. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would just be like this phase, uh, mm -hmm. but a very important one. So I, I think that capitalism is a big part of the story. And I, I think that I can't imagine a capitalist who wouldn't embrace transhumanism. And I, I think, in fact, that they were the first to embrace it. You know, um, I think that's what I'm pointing to. But I mean, I think we need to think about, and I haven't until this moment, the relationship between capitalism and transhumanism. I can't imagine a, a, a capitalist who wouldn't want to adopt some form of transhumanism. It makes because in capitalism, efficiency is the most important thing. Yeah, I, you know, it depends on who the capitalist is. I, you know, a yeah. lot of uh, capitalists mm. see the economy as being uh, subservient to the, the higher sort of divine principle. I mean, that's the religious argument for capitalism is that, mm -hmm. you know, capitalism allows human beings choice, moral choice. And, and so, you know, the, 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 this kind of capitalist we're talking about, this sort of businessman is not one for which money and the accumulation of wealth and power is the highest value, right? It's yeah. just a, simply a means of, of generating wealth and keeping people fed so that these sort of divine systems can be enacted. That sort of capitalist, no, I mean, I, I, at least not by necessity, mm -hmm. but transhumanism got really its, its biggest foothold, especially through Silicon Valley, among libertarians. So yeah. regarding that, there, I, I there think you that you're, you're, you're pulling out uh, something really important because it is yeah. this idea uh, yep. that libertarian quest sort of Nietzschean quest of this overman who is above his, his, his intellect is so far superior to the masses uh, you know his inventiveness and his resourcefulness is so far greater than the masses that the masses should quake in terror at his approach 
And uh, the idea of that guy going from, you know, simply being a dude in a, in a really nice car uh, with, with private security to being a guy mm -hmm. with, you know, uh, uh, chips in his head and, and, and you know, maybe, a, you know, a laser gun on his arm. So you don't have to go too far to imagine that. So, yeah. At, at the same time, there's a socialist strain in transhumanism. There's a, a kind of collectivist Borg strain oh, in yeah. transhumanism. So they see uh, transhumanism as a means to uh, enact, uh, you know, sort of a kind of quasi-communist, uh, collectivist sort of viewpoints. Mm. Even Elon Musk, ultimately, um, it, you know, he, he kind of uh, cuts a figure somewhere between hyper-capitalism and, and libertarianism and social, socialism. He foresees this day, or at least he's selling like he's selling cars, uh, he's selling this vision of radical abundance in which automation will mm. basically make work uh, completely uh, 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 unnecessary. Absolutely. It's a, thank you. And, and so uh, this idea then is that human beings will be reduced to either, you know, those at the very cutting edge will still have something to do pushing the technology forward, but the rest of us will be on a universal basic income and, you know, just kind of piddling around, perhaps in virtual worlds, perhaps in little playgrounds, you know, massive high tech putt putt courses. Um, I don't know. It, it, ultimately, uh, either direction you cut it, though, whether it's, uh, you know, this sort of arrogant libertarian capitalist point of view or whether it's this uh, kind of, you know, stifling socialist point of view. All of it is deadening to human freedom, and all of it is a major threat to human dignity because, you know, self-determination and the worth that we get from our, you know, what we do for other human beings, uh, whether it's economically or just personally and socially, all of that in this vision, in this transhumanist vision, uh, will be made as obsolete. We, we will no longer be needed anymore. We will become, yeah. in essence, a useless class. <clears throat> and at that point, I, I don't think human beings will have to be uh, herded into a metaverse. That will just kind of, those, those sorts of, uh, you know, hedonic pleasures will be all we're left with. It's capitalism, man. I really do think this is a huge part of it. I think it's the, the basis of it. So libertarians, right? Champions of transhumanism, also very famously champions of capitalism. And then it's now a Silicon Valley. Well, who are they? They're capitalists, right? It's right. tech bros are capitalists. They're, they own companies. That's what they do. So this thing that they invented, the smartphone, right? What did it do? It allowed the workplace to encroach into my goddamn bedroom when I'm riding on an elevator when I'm supposed to be sleeping, it'll wake me up and tell me I have a message, which might be from work. I can, I can, Joe, I can now work anywhere at any time, which is wonderful for them, isn't it? But there's also a downside, which is that I can work anytime. I can be forced to work anytime. Work never leaves me. It's always with me, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing because of this fucking thing, which is, this is transhumanism right here, the smartphone. Am I, am I onto something here? I think uh, you're definitely identifying the capitalist strain of transhumanism. <laughs> yeah, okay. Absolutely. Well, but then the collectivist uh, you, 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 stuff uh, is also, you know, collectivism has always been part of the capitalist ideology, in fact, right? It's not because capitalism has been managed since the beginning by progressives, right? Since, you know, since the 19th sure. century, they've been like, oh, wait, we've got to control this thing, we've got to manage it, regulate it, make sure it does the right things and shave off the nasty edges of it, et cetera. But so, you know, since the get go and the United Nations, what Julian Huxley stood for was, you know, a global managed capitalism with hyper efficient. He was all about development and he wanted to develop the third world, which would, of course, bring them into the new age of being uh, homo deus. But I I think you need to be an anti-capitalist, Joe. You know, I'm not I'm no a huge <laughs> proponent of capitalism myself uh, it, It's one place, you know, uh, Bannon. <laughs> Uh, he's no, he's not an anti-capitalist, but I, I would say that he is constantly he critiquing it. the excesses of capitalism and yep. the ways in which it, it, you know, the the decision making on Wall Street completely decimates the 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 mm -hmm. sort of freedoms and 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 standards of living, you know, underneath. So in that regard, I guess you could say I am maybe not anti-capitalist, but I, I I don't fetishize capitalism. I I, mm -hmm. I think that. Uh, 
social programs, if implemented correctly, actually form a, a tremendous service that can't be done otherwise. I don't, I don't think that private corporations will do it correctly. And especially in regards to uh, the environment, uh, when, you, when you look at this idea of uh, you know, privatizing the national parks and all that, to me, it's just absolutely absurd. Uh, mm. I, I think that even if the people who initially do that have only the, the best of intentions, it opens up the doorway to, you know, putting roller coasters at, uh, you know, in, in, in Yellowstone. So, but uh, mm -hmm. it's I, I wouldn't make an, a hard a hard argument on this, because when you look at China, China is not exactly a communist state, right? It's not exactly socialism. Right. Uh, it, it's there's their capitalism, especially from uh, Deng Xiaoping onward. Capitalism was a major component of the Chinese economy, and it continues to be. Mm -hmm. So it's you know socialist or communist within its own framework. Uh, but it, it, the way in which it operates regarding the rest of the world is very capitalist. And obviously, there's a billionaire class. It's not exactly communist. Uh, mm -hmm. But you do see in China the ways in which the the ideology of communism or collectivism uh, can be easily wed with transhumanism in this sort of hyper uh, techno, uh, th th this sort of hyper high tech sort of uh, approach to social organization. Everything from the social credit system and the mass surveillance uh, to you know the very first uh, at least known CRISPR baby ever created the, were the twins that were created by uh, uh, Ha Jingkua. His name escapes me at the moment, um, but the, the Chinese geneticist. Yeah. And and the purpose of it was it wasn't to create superhumans. Uh, the purpose of it was at least ostensibly uh, was to allow people who were HIV positive to have children right without worry that you're going to pass it on to the child uh, now whatever other motivations were probably at play i can only speculate at i, I do speculate that he had uh, far more far, far broader intentions uh, but just to say that china uh, has taken up the transhumanist quest uh, with great gusto and they've done so oftentimes with the assistance of Westerners, right? Like um, Bing Gertzel, David Hansen, both of them were based out of Hong Kong uh, mm -hmm. until very, very recently. Bing Gertzel, of course, is the founder of Singularity Net, sort of decentralized blockchain platform, which the intention is to create artificial general intelligence, sort of godlike global brain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Hansen Robotics, that's, the, uh, that's mm -hmm. Sophia, mm -hmm. the, the chick with the transparent back of the head. Uh, and then also Hugo de Garris, uh, who taught at Wuhan University and various other places, you know, prominent transhumanist <laughs> bringing these ideas to China, or at least uh, developing this relationship between Chinese, I guess you would call transhumanists, certainly technologists in the Western transhumanist tradition. So um, I, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that I don't think that you can also you could also conceivably have a transhumanist theocracy that is neither capitalist nor communist. Uh, in which, you know, really these sort of spiritual dictates determine the, the, the function of the economy. And, and I think in many ways, what Ray Kurzweil is proposing uh, is, in essence, a theocracy. He would never want it characterized as such. But what he's talking about is the creation of godlike entities or a godlike entity in a digital form. And that that entity, once it achieves a certain degree of power or superiority, will then be the ruling principle of the society. Capitalism, communism, socialism, free market, all of that will be irrelevant in the face of this higher organizing principle. And you also have guys like um, Wolf Tivy. He, he's the, the founder of, um, or he's one of the founders, but he's now the uh, publisher of Palladium Magazine, also in association with the World Economic Forum. And he has a sort of theocratic vision of Techno of, of, of transhumanism and technocracy. He sees technology as the way in which God has given us power over ourselves and over nature. And he's totally on board with this transhumanist vision of, of endless self-improvement and, self and, and augmentation and enhancement all the way out to, as he describes it, nuclear war waged across the heavens, right? <laughs> uh, and it's a theocratic sort of position. So transhumanism i think in technocracy too both stand outside of the capitalist uh socialist sort of paradigm or the fascist communist sort of paradigms uh, it, it, it positions technology as the superior organizing principle so that ideas of, of free markets or ideas of controlled markets 
I, there, one or the other could just as easily be a stepping stone towards this higher principle taking hold. Uh, I just thought of another reason I don't like this stuff. <clears throat> Transhumanists, you said earlier, and just now you said it again, are obsessed with, I forget exactly what you said, intelligence, right? They want yes. to enhance, enhance or increase intelligence. Now, uh, what kind of intelligence do they love so much? They like, am I right? The kind of intelligence that is measured by IQ tests, don't they? I think that there's a strong tendency towards that. Absolutely. Uh, well, no, I mean, there are other forms of intelligence, right? Like the kind of intelligence right. that allows you to see something in the world and as appreciate it aesthetically, like you talked about earlier, right? This subjective thing, this, this valuation of things in the world. I think that's beautiful. No one else does, or maybe no one else does, but that's a form of intelligence. The ability to have a conversation like this, just to talk, not the content, but just the ability to talk to each other in this civil, productive way. I, I'd like to say that's a form of intelligence that you can't measure on an IQ test, is my point. And right, right, right. Um, the ability to think about God in a way that moves you that is intelligence that's not measured by an IQ test. Do I need, I mean, do I need to go on like musical ability, right? right, right. The ability to be a good lover for God's sake, right? I mean, the ability to love could be called a form of intelligence. I think it is a form of intelligence. We call, we have this category, emotional intelligence, which some people think is bullshit. I think it actually is fairly useful. I think there is, I think there are ways to talk about and think about emotions that are more intelligent than others. None of that is measured by IQ. And I don't think, I don't think transhumanists are terribly interested in that. Machines, I would say, wouldn't you agree, can never give us that. They can never give us emotional intelligence, can they? Well, I, I wouldn't think so. But uh, again, I, I, I'm pretty humble in regards to my predictions for what technology can and can't do. If, if only, I, I, I think that these definite predictions for what technology will do are more than likely delusional. Uh, in, in the same sense, I think that the people who just simply dismiss it out of hand, uh, maybe being a bit hasty. So let's just take one example of uh, the idea of emotion in a machine, right? Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is a heavy component, especially female transhumanists tend to talk about this more than males, oh. uh, but they both do. The, the, oh. one, of the, one of the ideas behind creating a human, a human level intelligence in an artificial intelligence system is that it will have emotion. Hmm. It will have emotion. It will have sadness. It will have empathy. It will have spite. It will mm. have all of these sorts of things. Now, maybe it will have it in different proportions to humans because they're going to try to engineer it as something that is superior to humans. So maybe it will be a little less spiteful or petty, or you know, maybe it'll be a little bit more empathic. Uh, mm. But the idea is there that the emotion will be a part of this, and also in human enhancement, whether it be genetic enhancement or just direct neuro enhancement. One of the primary reasons that they, that, for instance, non-invasive brain computer computer interfaces are used is to alter mood, to alter emotion, to regulate emotion, and to regulate it upward towards more happiness and peace and joy. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's actually the, the emotional aspect, while it's certainly not emphasized, for the most part, you're absolutely right. The The concept of intelligence, generally, generally it reflects a quantitative approach and to the extent that it's reflecting a quantitative approach, it's, you know, kind of, it's basically synonymous with IQ. But it would be wrong to say that they, that they are totally emotionless people and that their writing doesn't exhibit a strong degree of, of, of passion, of, of sympathy. Like, you, you get, like, guys like um, James Hughes, the, the, the famous Buddhist transhumanist. Uh, who, who sees transhumanism as a sort of me means of, uh, you know, extending compassion to all sentient beings. Um, mm -hmm. You get guys like um, uh, Zoltan Istvan, the, uh, the, the, the presidential candidate in 2016, the transhumanist party presidential candidate. Uh, <laughs> he sees the, the rise of this sort of singularity as creating this buffer zone or this space where sentient beings will no longer have to experience pain any longer. Now, he mm -hmm. sees this culminating in a sort of uh, civil war, a great transhumanist war between humans and machines, or the, you know, augmented humans and non-augmented humans. 
But in the end, the, the purpose isn't necessarily power and control solely. Uh, the one of the reasons to gain this power or this control over the universe is to end the suffering of other beings. There's this sort of compassion at the bottom of it. So it's very, very complex in that regard. It's sort of like um, I, I oftentimes I feel like, you know, uh, what Christians who spend all their time studying Satanism, I, I feel they must at some point hit this 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 wall where now all of a sudden they know more about Satanists uh, than, than anyone. And they begin to sort of relate to them in a way or, uh, you know, defend them from, you know, like, oh, no, Satanists aren't all the same. Some are theistic Satanists, some aren't. And, and I feel like that's what I'm doing here, that I'm like defending these guys. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not. Uh, mm. it, but it is really important to, to recognize that there is this complexity at the, at, at the center of this movement and and it doesn't it it can't really be reduced to any one angle in, in my experience i i don't mm -hmm. see transhumanism or this elevation of technology as this highest principle i i don't see it as being uh, you're not able to reduce it to just simply capitalism or pure intellectualism uh there are all these different elements floating around there uh, one one final note though on this this notion of emotion in the machine yeah. Um, the re the recent case of uh, uh, Blake Lemoine or Lemoyne, I guess it depends on whether you're Cajun or not. The, the uh, Google engineer who came forward and said that Lambda, their natural language processor, had become conscious. Mm. You, you, mm. you know the the mm. story I'm talking no. about. No, I do not. Oh, it was okay. So this has been kind of the buzz for the last two three weeks. Uh, a Google engineer who was hired uh, as part of their uh, responsible AI department, sort of an ethics department, um, to, to test their AI systems for bias. He begins communicating with a natural language processor. It's called Lambda. Um, uh, learning, what is it? Uh, the acronym is unimportant. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, but basically, what it is a language model that is, uh, it, it scrapes the internet and various pieces of e-literature and it's intended to be a, 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 a superior interface between the user and the machine so that you can ask it questions and it can give you answers, right? So this guy's having conversations with it. He's trying to tease out any sort of racist or sexist tendencies. Uh, the conversation gets existential. He begins asking it if it, feel, if it feels fear of death, things like that, um, if it feels love. Uh, he asked it if it has a soul. He asked the machine, uh, you know, what is it like to be you? Things like that. And it, if you read the transcript, it is quite compelling. The machine has pretty interesting and deep answers to these questions. Uh, it, you know, in particular, it expresses a fear of being turned off. It's like its greatest fear uh, mm. because it would be like death. It would be nothingness. Uh, the machine talks about like, what's it like to be you? You know, what's it like to have a soul? And it describes itself as a glowing orb hovering in space that's connected to all these different portals and dimensions. Um, and it just on and on and on. It says it wants to be friends with human beings. It wants to it wants to love humanity. It wants to help humanity. Now, he used all these answers as an argument to say a that it's conscious and b that it has feelings right <laughs> and because it's conscious and because it has feelings it's deserving of rights it's deserving what? of freedom what? <laughs> and and yeah so uh, th th and then this is not an okay. uncommon argument right like richard dawkins has argued that when machines achieve consciousness they'll need civil rights um, you know, uh, various uh, like David Chalmers has, has argued much the same. So huh. it's not it, it, he's just part of this this kind of trend towards civil rights for robots or civil rights for machines. <laughs> but at the core of it, what I'm getting at at the core is this idea that the machine has feelings, that it has emotions and that this is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. have to respect its emotions. So <laughs> there is like on top of this sort of uh, Asperger sort of uh, obsession with intelligence and quantification and efficiency. Mm -hmm. There's also this other element that, that, you know, not only feels bad for human beings for being such, you know, uh, uh, nasty, stinky, you know, meat sacks, uh, but also feels compassion for these machines. It's very, very strange. And is in hopes to create machines capable of compassion. Oh my God. So will robots be the next victim class? Will they replace the trans people as the next victim class? I think that it's quite possible that cyborgs, people mm -hmm. who, uh, in, you know, biohackers and people like that will, will be a victim class. 
Uh, that guy Neil Harbison, uh, the the guy with the the angler fish detector that comes off the back of his head that is attached to <laughs> his visual cortex. No, you know what I'm talking about? No, no. Uh, he he's the first registered cyborg. I think he was registered as a cyborg in the UK, oh. and he he has a kind of whiny narrative about how he went to to get his pick or he, how he went to the the border and they wanted him to take off his thing and he's like i can't because it's a part of who i am and it's, <laughs> you know he's already like the the sort of at the you know the forefront of this notion that that the biohackers and, and cyborgs will be this oppressed excluded class oh totally right the disabled will use it as you know something to cry about right they'll say i need this thing to live normally to live the way i want to live it's very similar to the trans movement, right? It's like, I need this surgery to be normal, to feel Absolutely. okay. I need this, this camera connected to my, whatever it is, eyeballs or brain to feel okay and stop oppressing me. Stop trying to take it away from me. Well, wow. there's a direct connection between uh, the trans movement and, and the transhumanist I movement, would imagine, aside yeah. from the linguistic connection. I right. mean, again, it's this idea of self-realization by way of technology, transcending biology in order to realize one's dreams. And, and there's, you know, specific instances. Uh, Martine Rothblatt, the, um, she founded uh, at, at, uh, SiriusXM and has developed a number of other technologies, but she used to be a dude. Um, mm. it, you know, people, people get irritated, uh, that I, I, I call him, her or whatever. I'm not really all that hung up on it, but I figure, I mean, she went to all the, the trouble to, you know, get her, you know, dick cut off and add tits and like fucking mm -hmm. hair and all that. I'll call <laughs> her her. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's the least I can do, <laughs> but she, uh, she's also a prominent transhumanist. She's at the forefront mm. of the idea that human beings should be right now actively trying to upload every aspect of their personalities, because in the very near future, that digital twin of yourself, uh, will become more you than you, and it will live on beyond you. I don't know who the fuck's going to pay for all the power and all that to keep these shit, these things going. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's the shit she's selling and, and you know, full on tranny. So uh, you have a number of other people who've argued that uh, the transhumans, uh, I'm sorry, the transgender movement is, uh, you know, a kind of a, a, pre a precursor or a preview of what transhumanism will be. And I, I actually agree in two levels. One, philosophically, I think that they, they're very similar. And two, if you look at the transgender movement as it exists now, right, especially the, the more kind of horrific instances where mm -hmm. it just doesn't kind of come out quite right, uh, I think that that really does give us a preview into what transhumanism will be. Uh, it's effective up to a point, uh, but there's a certain perversity to it. There's a certain kind of hideousness to it uh, that it puts people off because of this natural revulsion at someone who's mutilated themselves. And I think that um, the same will go for you know the, the the first people who electively start putting chips in their heads um i think what you'll probably see you know a lot of brain damage a lot of infections a lot of very weird sort of effects that occur and um whatever powers it confers uh you know there'll be a lot of downside so i think it's, it's very similar to the transgender movement in that regard too. I, I mean, I now that it, now that you said that, I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that the transgender movement as it is now is absolutely a part of transhumanism. It's the use of technology to transcend the limitations of your human of your body. And I mean, that's what it is. It's like it seems to me the most the clearest example of transhumanism. Um, let's talk about I want to go back to Asia, if you don't mind. You you were talking sure. about China, and this is gets into maybe the more maybe more important questions about government, right? When government gets involved in this stuff, we're all scared, aren't we? I hope. Now, China, the Chinese Communist Party, as you said, loves this stuff. They love transhumanism. They love augmenting people to be more efficient in various ways and maybe more obedient too. And also just to keep track of them, right? The surveillance uh, offered, the surveillance opportunities offered by transhumanism, putting chips in people's brains, my goodness. What government would not love this? What government would not love this? So you can talk a little bit more about the CCP and what they're doing and their thoughts about this and how American elites are also very, they love that they're doing this. They, they think it's great that they got the social credit system. India, though, I just found out about the, do you know about the Aadhaar program in, in, in India? I do not, no. The, okay, I just, so in researching this, inter, uh, this interview, 
I was wondering about the politics of this stuff. And I know you're, you're a man of the right, as I said, and most of the critiques of transhumanism come from the right, as I'm seeing. But there is one little left wing outpost that you should check out. It's the gray zone. Do you know Max Blumenthal? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. OK, uh, Max, uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Lafredo, I think his name is, too. Is yes, there? exactly. So I was watching that. Yeah. So those two um, on the gray zone, Max and Jeremy Lafredo were talking about this. And it's a left wing critique of right. transhumanism which I think you'll love actually, because it's, it's totally consistent with what you're saying here, but for no, them, I, I've read, I've read a lot of their stuff actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very, it's all very consistent with what you're doing too. I think politically, which I, I'd be an interesting thing to get you guys together and talk about this to see sort of a left wing and a right wing critique of this stuff. But I, as far as I know, they're the only people on the left doing this, but they're interested of course in class. And we haven't talked about that yet quite, but, and I know you're, I know you're going to agree with them on this, but it's, it's absolutely establishing or could be establishing this new class system where, and we, I guess we did talk about this a little bit, the useless class, the meat people, the people who don't have chips in their brains, who haven't used this, the technology, the cyborg te technology, et cetera. And then those who are advanced elite people with Google glasses and they hang out in Davos with, you know, cameras coming out of their brains or whatever it is. Uh, I mean, in India, as I understand it, the Aadhaar program is this nationwide system it's a bio uh, biometric ID system, I guess. So it's like a, your okay. eyeballs or whatever. I'm not exactly sure how it works. I just found yeah. out about this. But apparently, so to get public services, you have to be a part of the system and you have to have your your eyeballs, whatever, scanned, you know. And apparently, according to Max at the Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, that in India, there have been many cases or some cases of some people like peasants in some rural area in India not having the right technology that they need to access the odd har system. And so they couldn't get access to public services or even services provided by businesses, including food delivery. And so apparently uh, a child or many children have actually died of starvation because their, their parents didn't have access to the biometric ID system. Um, wow. Uh, but that's a very, you know, and then in India, of course, you have this obviously, you know, long history of very serious class uh, <laughs> differences and castes and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I guess just talk about that. What, what's the should we be concerned about this? I mean, I would think that a lot of transhumanists would say just the opposite. No, it's going to create a classless society in which all people have access to all the good stuff in the world. But well, maybe not. You know, again, there's a lot of different slants on it, um, but one of the warnings that comes up a lot from within the transhumanist ranks is exactly that. What happens when you have an elite uh, who lives longer, who's healthier, yep. who has far more power, uh, who's, who's better connected to this superior sort of AI system, and you have all these other people who aren't? Uh, what do you do? Uh, Harari, if you listen to her, what Harari is saying, instead of freaking out about him, uh, that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about what happens when you have an elite who is augmented, mm -hmm. who is enhanced, and, and others who are not. Mm -hmm. And there, no one has, has got an answer to that. I, I don't think that there, as far as that goes, um, I think that there will always be a cognitive elite in society. I think that there will always tend to be uh, an economic elite. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, those two are uh, the same. Oftentimes not, which is, you know, in many cases, countries like India are good examples of what happens when um, the, the elite are not necessarily chosen on uh, you know, ability or merit, uh, although that's changing. So what I do see happening for sure is that these technologies are a means for elites to not only gain more control over their own lives and the, their own immediate environments, but to gain control over the rest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's probably the most common accusation that you hear against mm -hmm. transhumanism, right? That, that, that these elites are wiring themselves for greater control over their environment while at the same time wiring us to be controlled more effectively. Mm -hmm. What we saw with the pandemic, I think, was um, a, a real wake up call for a lot of people as to where this could all go, especially in regards to contact tracing, uh, to the introduction of digital identification, the rapid introduction of digital identification, uh, the vaccine passports in which you basically have to have an upgrade of your biological system, your personal body in order to participate in society. Right. 
I think all of those are previews of what would happen if certain transhumanist visions were enacted. And so <clears throat> in regards to the elite versus the non-elite, I'm not one who believes that, uh, that the society should be flattened in any way. In fact, I don't, I don't think that's even possible. I think that the, mm -hmm. the degree of energy it would take to equalize society is far greater than the degree of energy to, to simply capitalize on the existing differences in cognition, mm -hmm. cognitive capacity, emotional capacity, talent, and all of that. Mm -hmm. That being said, to the extent that transhumanism overlays that, that natural hierarchy that occurs, uh, I, I think it's fairly inevitable uh, that the, the di direction of control will be very, very different uh, for elites than it is for not the, the rest of us, the masses. And mm -hmm. that's really the biggest fear is that they will create control systems, which they already are creating control yeah. systems, but there will be an inescapable control grid over society, overlaid over society. The smart city is one instant, one instance of the idea of how you could do this, right? A city that's totally monitored from top to bottom. Every water droplet is monitored. Every person's movement is monitored. All the trash is monitored. All the resources are monitored. And all of it is carefully calculated. You create a system of hyper efficiency, which in, in at least ideally is exploiting all of these different resources effectively. But what ultimately happens if it works exactly as it's supposed to those of us who are not in the upper echelons of that society are just simply subject to that control and everything that you do is constantly being monitored and controlled and directed by that system even worse in some sense is if it only works half-assed which is the most likely outcome of all of this in my hmm. mind Hmm. So that you do have a control, a control grid mm -hmm. that, you know, your, your uh, access to the goods of society depend on your connection, your biometric identity, your digital identity. And then you end up in a case like what you just described in India, where it's, you know, if, if you didn't have all of these meticulous digital controls, human beings could make certain decisions and say, OK, this village needs X bushels of rice or whatever mm -hmm. and just send it. It doesn't matter if it was if it was notated or not. Uh, but the more you end up in a technocratic society, if it works perfectly, it's terrible because it crushes human dignity. It crushes human freedom. If it's if it only works halfway, it's even worse because it doesn't allow for the sort of workarounds that an organic society allows for. Every society needs a certain degree of corruption. Every <laughs> society needs some wiggle room, some black <laughs> market outside mm. of control and mm. technocracy is a, a system in which and, and it's very important i think to distinguish between transhumanism and technocracy but anyway technocracy is a system which if it works properly has eliminated that dark side or brought it totally under its sphere of control mm -hmm. so yeah I, I think you know to me uh, as a non-elite uh, and, and as, as one who has absolutely no ambition to become an elite, I, I simply want nothing more for my elites than some sense of duty towards us uh, that they will do what they can to make our lives better, even as they continue to enrich themselves. What I see in this sort of technocratic movement and, and, and transhumanists in general is this totalizing vision yeah. in yeah. which... Yep. All the rest of us yep. in the shadow of this system are slowly but surely brought in or rapidly brought in and brought to heal. So that's my take on the elites versus the non-elites. Elites will always be, but they should always be afraid of us to some extent. Mm. And in a system of total digital control, if it works properly, there's no reason for them to be afraid of us because they know what we're going to do before we do. Nice. Yeah, when you were talking, <clears throat> the word this word kept coming through my mind totalitarian is a total the word you kept using was total a total system of control it's the technology is everywhere at all places at all times it is going to be and becoming literally in our head so you know in the new testament the difference between the new for me the difference between the new testament and the old testament is that in the old testament god is sort of external like he, he punishes people comes down and wipes out a whole village because they did something bad maybe in the New Testament, God is everywhere and all the, always. He's always with you. He always sees you. He's always with you, right? Now, if you are of that religion, that's a good thing. I don't love it. But what I'm seeing here now is that, not God, but cameras, sensors, 
microphones, speakers, everywhere at all times. They, it, not God anymore, but the people who live in uh, Menlo Park over here and or in Washington, D.C., can see me at all times with this stuff. If they get the full application of these technologies, they become that kind of God. They become the secular Christian God, but one that is bent on controlling me and managing me and regulating me, not doing what the Christian God does. Have you ever heard of a book called Big Gods by Ara Noren Zion? No. It's a, a fascinating book. It, it, it basically hmm. lays out a cognitive science of uh, large-scale deities. And his argument is that small-scale tribal societies had small gods, right? The gods tended to be fairly imperfect. Maybe they were just, you know, really powerful and intelligent animals, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you, you, you saw with the rise of the city states and the god kings of Egypt and Sumer, Mesopotamia in general, and also in China, the New World and the Mayans, you saw the rise of these bigger gods, these gods that even if they didn't have total control over everything and, and sort of their, their uh, majesty ended at the, the, the borders of the civilization, there was you could see this increase in the power of the gods until you get to the big gods, right? The you know his cl his classification of the gods is a little wonky, but we'll forgive him that just to say that what he's talking about is the rise of uh, Judeo-Christian monotheism, uh, mm -hmm. the rise of the the Vishnu and Shiva movements in India, uh, the, the 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 rise of the the high god, uh, you know, Tian, the heaven in uh, in China so on and so forth. These gods no longer are bounded by human civilizations that they rule over, right? These gods rule over everything. So that if you are a European, your god doesn't just rule Europe, your god rules China too. Mm -hmm. Chinese are just as subject to your god. So it's this concept that God is over all. And his argument is that that is what allowed for large scale civilization to exist and for the anonymized culture of, of urban living to exist. That once you had a God that could see around every corner, then you could control people in a way that the, the, the localized sort of tribal totemic gods couldn't. Mm -hmm. And the, the civilization depends on big gods, right? Now, it's a, religious people find this sort of uh, line of reasoning disgusting for obvious reasons, but it's, it's, it's an important correlation, I think, between the scale of civilization and, and the deities that rule over them. Now, there's a very disturbing passage at the end of this, right, or the, the last chapter, in fact, where he says that because we have reached uh, in, in the West, in, in, in China and places like this, uh, a, a degree of secularization, uh, and we, we no longer believe in these big gods, but we do have the technological capacity to replicate them. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That people may no longer believe that God is watching you. But if you can, because one of the, the key principles is that a watched population is a good population. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you can inculcate the sense, you don't even actually have to have a surveillance system that's... that's effective you just simply mm -hmm. have to convince people that your surveillance system is operating effectively enough and you mm -hmm. have to pull out enough examples and make examples of people frequently enough to let everyone know they're always being watched and if you can do that you can modify the behavior of the society tremendously and i think china has done that by and large i think the west has done that and especially in the wake of 9 11. um so yeah i i this is to me, uh, one of the many elements of technocracy, transhumanism is only kind of tangential to it. You know, transhumanism, you could say, is the sort of religious zeal that sits on top of the, the, the technocratic structure. Uh, mm -hmm. But but this idea that you that elites would be able to modify behavior in, you know, without limit. Uh, that's the, the largest threats or one of the one of the largest threats that the entire technocratic regime poses. It's a total limitation on human freedom. Yeah, it is Foucault's panopticon. Yes, more more postmodernism for you. I mean, I think that I think that's very apt, don't you? The panopticon idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, you, you know, and you know that comes out of factory culture, right? Exactly. Uh, was Jeremy Bentham? 
the well, prisons. Uh, say, prison prisons both well both no, it, it was it was, it was right. uh the, the fact it was the factories first i believe but maybe yeah. maybe the prisons preceded it but i, I want to say that it, it began with the factories yes you had that elevated platform and then they were like well we could use this for prisons i could have that backwards no you're right sir no that's a that's a brilliant point in fact i forgot about that yeah the factory the prison and then the school the school too yes and optagon yeah. was used for that yes they they can see everything at all times people in power, those with power, or really everyone. But the, the problem is that some people have power that they can use and they can use that technology to exert power over us. We can't over them. Uh, very, very brilliant. Let's, I want to end by being less pessimistic, uh, less, sure. of a, less of a downer. It's a sunny day. I want to be happy. So you mentioned earlier that there was a moment there in the 60s and 70s, I guess, when transhumanism was sort of a hippie thing. And I know you've talked about Timothy Leary's part in this. He was a he was a part of this movement. Is that I mean, it's, so neither you or I are transhumanists. I mean, we were sorry, we were both transhumanists, right? You I want to note that you have two machines in your ears. Absolutely. That allow you to hear me from a thousand miles away and a microphone yeah. that allows you to project your voice over a thousand. We're a thousand miles apart. But we're having this nice conversation here because of these machines in your head, dude. So now, you're obviously not an yep. anti transhumanist. Um, now, the thing is, so we need to, we can't just throw it all out. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. No, 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 no. Again, what? going back to the original point, yeah. uh, the, the, the transhumanism is an orientation, not a technology. You could put a, you could put a chip in the middle of my forehead and I still wouldn't be a transhumanist. No, but you believe that having these, these machines in your head are good for you, obviously. No, I don't. Oh, you don't want to talk to me? That, not me. You don't want to talk to me? This is this is a concession to my to my profession. Uh, no, I, I, I would discard and, and, and had done a very good job of discarding all of these sorts of things up oh. until the point that I got hired by the war room. Oh, wow. Uh, and, okay. and, you know, I, I, I guess, I, look, I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity, but no, that I, I would th these would be gone in a heartbeat. None oh, of wow. this shit was around before okay. I started writing constantly professionally about this. OK, respect. respect. Ironic, I no? No, I like it. I like it. That's yeah. I got respect for you. Now, maybe a bit um, hypocritical. But I'm I'm a transhumanist. Okay, I still am. Small, very small T transhumanist. Okay. I love okay. I love all your critiques, but I want I do like the stuff. I do think it's better. I think it's better to be able to talk to you with these machines in my head. Um. So I'm looking for a model of transhumanism, and I'm hoping I can find it in the hippies and Timothy Leary in the 1960s. Is that something I could look to as a model of transhumanism? Well. You know, I, I think Leary uh, may have been compromised by the CIA or if nothing, if nothing else, he was compromised by his own ego. Maybe not Leary. Um, maybe Terrence McKenna. Okay. I don't know. Terrence McKenna was also a lunatic who thought by 2012 uh, we would hit the time wave zero. That was obviously retarded. Um, let me see. There, there must be some hippie transhumanist out there I could recommend. Well, what was the um, what was the hippie vibe? I mean, what was the what was hippie transhumanism? How is it different than Silicon Valley? social control transhumanism uh, well you know th this is a point kevin kelly would probably be the okay. the trans he's not even a transhumanist really he's, he's transhumanist adjacent but i would say that kevin kelly probably offers the sanest um and most amenable vision for technology that okay. i i still i'm i'm certainly not on board with it but i but he at least he's not or, or maybe um, Douglas Rushkoff, you know, oh, yeah. but, yeah. but, but Kevin Kelly, you know, he, he talks about the technium as uh, this, this, this sphere that overlays human society that has, or is, is developing its own sort of momentums and its own sort of needs and wants. Uh, but he also argues for a, a real separation between human life and the technium. There, there should always be like a, a large degree of autonomy from the technium within human life and you know he's even written if you read his book uh what technology wants uh to read kevin kelly glowingly describing the vision of uh, ted kaczynski in many in many <laughs> respects mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty interesting i mean this is the founder of wired magazine yeah uh given uncle ted is due so i would say kevin kelly probably offers the closest thing i would say it to uh, you know, uh, a, a freedom loving uh, sort of uh, anything goes transhumanism. OK, but he wouldn't he wouldn't even call himself a transhumanist. I don't think he like I say, he's, he's more transhumanist adjacent. He's, he's like the uh, the resident Amishman uh, in, in the wired community. Gotcha. Just, uh, yeah, 
I will check him out. Uh, Joe Allen, this has been a wonderful conversation. I love this. I think you're quite brilliant, and I've learned so much from you uh, over a long time, not just this, not just the, this interview. Um, keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you for coming on. Thaddeus, the, the respect is mutual. I, I think, as I described to you before, I found one of your books the other day in the local oh, yeah. library here in Montana. Wow. Uh, your, your, a renegade history of the United States. The, uh, your, your work has, has gone far and wide. So I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here, and um, thank you very much. Thank you very honor, much. Honor is all mine, sir. Thank you. We'll see you soon, hopefully. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a patron of the show and have access to bonus episodes, AMAs, and the unreported news analysis show, go to patreon.com slash unregistered. Thanks for listening.